Hello, welcome to Veteran Voice. My name's Larry McCullough, I'll be your host today. Uh, I've got a couple of veterans with me today who have done a variety of things, but I, the main thing we wanted to talk about was uh, uh, soldiers that served, soldiers and sailors, military veterans who served during what was referred to as the Cold War. So I've picked up a couple today who have worn many hats and done many things uh, in the military and since they got out of the military. So my guest today on my left is John Davis. John is the current commander of the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, Post 1191, here in Paducah. Uh, John, welcome, welcome to the program today. Thank you. And nice to, be to, here. to on my right is uh, Eddie Thurman. Eddie happens to be the junior vice commander for the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Uh, both of them served overseas and in Europe uh, during the Cold War. John, I know, was in Vietnam for a, at least one tour. So, guys, the way I usually start out is is. Uh, John, why don't you give us a little bit of background about when you went into the military, uh, you know, why you joined, where you joined, and what your uh, basic was like, and just a well, little background on it. The reason I joined the military was my dad told me to get a job, and I told him I had a job. I was an usher at Rosa Claire Theater in Rosa Claire, Illinois, making 50 cents an hour. And the next morning, he got me up, and we came to Paducah, Kentucky, and I enlisted in the Army. <laughs> He got me a real job. So Dad encouraged you. Yes, very much so. That was in uh, February 3rd, 1964. I went through basic training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. went through AIT at Fort Gordon, Georgia as a military policeman. Graduated July the 10th, my birthday in 64. At 6 o'clock, I was on an airplane flying to JFK Airport going to... Uh, England. From there I rode train for eight hours north to Harrogate, England, 13th Field Station and Army Security Agency and I spent four months there and then Uncle Sam saw fit to send me to Germany among my glorious travels. <laughs> anyway, we were over there from 60, September 64 to uh, October of 66 and then I went to Nam from December 66 to 67. And then after Vietnam did you did you come back stateside? I, and uh, how, how long I, did you? I got an early out. I okay. had less than than uh, 90 days left. Okay. How, how, how long did you did you spend in the army? I thought you I, I retired out of the Illinois National Guard. Oh, okay. But I only spent uh, just a little bit shy of 4 years active, active army. duty but stayed in the, in the guard afterwards yeah i went back in the guard after vietnam was over with and okay. and retired out of it as first sergeant for a combat support company up in chicago illinois okay we're good how about you eddie tell us a little bit about how you did your daddy drag you down to the no to or? <laughs> no i drug my own self down there I, <laughs> something i'd always wanted to do so just as soon as i turned 17 i was biting at the bullet and uh in january of uh 62, I went down and enlisted, and uh, I guess on uh, my mother wasn't real proud of it, but <laughs> I was I left and I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was from Louisville, and uh, that's where I enlisted, and I went for, took basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and uh, then from uh, Fort Knox, I went to Fort Sam Houston, uh, Texas, uh, for medical school. Went through med school. And uh, I left there and went to Fort Carson, Colorado. And I was in the uh, 5th Division out there in a field hospital, but I was assigned to the general hospital and worked in the hospital there. And then after uh, I come down on the roster to go overseas, go to Germany, and uh, I went to a little town called Ludwigsburg, Germany. It's right outside of Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, I was in a, what they call a clearing company, uh, ambulance and a clearing company is, uh, best way to describe it is probably a small order of a mass unit. It wasn't quite as big as a, a full mass unit, but it was on a smaller order. And I stayed over there for 27 months. And I come back and I kind of clown around about my early out. I did get out early, uh, uh, 18 days. So uh, as soon as I got back to Brooklyn, they discharged us right there on the dock. Well, good. So, so, so you spent about four, 
four years in also? No, uh, three years. But three years uh, after duty? But, but most of it was over in Germany? 27 Georgia. months of it was in Germany. Okay, so uh, at pretty much the same place? Yeah, I okay. stayed, stayed the same place. Uh, now we went to TDY uh, 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 to the general hospital there in Stuttgart uh, a couple times and then of course we was always out on maneuvers and you know and, and going different places but yeah I was in the same outfit all the time I was over. Okay uh, now, like I say for some of the younger viewers we probably we, I don't know if we do or not but we want to explain what the Cold War was is basically after after World War II and after Korea Russia you know we during were World War II, war, yeah. world from Russia. Yes, they they uh, they were our ally in World War II, and then as time went by, and they they developed the same type of weapons that we had. Uh, got to be like that. Well, we don't want to talk to them anymore, and they didn't want to talk to us. And uh, at that time, there was a large buildup of, of nuclear weapons and atomic weapons, and and there was uh, there were actually no bombs flying back and forth, but. The uh, the Russians and uh, had gone communist and uh, they were living their kind of life and they liked it and resented ours and and vice versa. So the actual Cold War, I don't know if there was ever any any I don't believe there's any battles or anything that was was ever uh, were ever I fought. Don't, I don't think there was any battles. There was uh, uh, per se, but uh, the tension was there and uh, I guess I remember uh, this. Uh, the closest that I remember ever coming to maybe even actually going to war was during the Cuban blockade. And uh, I was on a ship going overseas when that happened and uh, they come over and said they was going to cut our speed down because they didn't know whether we was going to go on and go to Germany or turn and, and go somewhere toward Cuba. And uh, I, I never will forget, I was 17 years old sitting out in the hallway of that ship on the steps and saying, they gonna fight down there, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, but we knew uh, that was one of the things that uh, when we went in, we knew what we was getting into. I think that that's the closest the world ever came to a nuclear war was in uh, was uh, I think they call it John it was a called the missile of, of October, and I remember that happened around my birthday which is the 26th of October, and I remember it was right during that Cuban, time period. Cuban and crisis. it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was the Cuban crisis because mm -hmm. they had moved in Soviet uh, nuclear weapons, and President Kennedy decided we he wouldn't was, take ours out of Turkey. Yeah, and and that's the closest it ever came. So, all right, now John, you said you were in the MPs. Yes, sir. All right. So while you were in uh, over, overseas fighting the Cold War. Did you ever have to pick him up sometime to lock him up for anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I could truthfully say I only arrested one person. Really? Yes. You weren't a very good cop, were you? I was an excellent cop. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had stopped this busload of young soldiers that came in the three nineteenth SA battalion there in in Rothwestern Germany, which is about 12 clicks north of Castle, Germany, a town of about 150,000. And they came in that night and they were late. And I went up there and nobody had passes, so they all filed down off of it and we put them up against the wall and started searching them. And I stuck my hands down in that guy's pants and come around and my thumb and my hand was bloody when I pulled it out. He'd been in a knife fight downtown and got stabbed. <laughs> So we we arrested about half of that busload of people, and at four o'clock the next afternoon, this was at one o'clock in the morning. At four o'clock the next afternoon, I was still filling out paperwork, <laughs> and I made up my mind then and there, I might kill them, but I'll never <laughs> arrest them, <laughs> not again. So did. <coughs> what, what, what did you mainly do? You uh, observed checkpoints? And we were, we were uh, in charge of uh, classified equipment, information, and personnel. Oh, so you were, it was important that you made sure you knew who was coming in and out because of the, uh, because of the top secret stuff well, you were taking care at, of. Well, uh, Rothwestern was an old Luftwaffe Air Force Base, and you looked right down the fold of gap. The who do? The fold of gap. That was where the Russians were supposed to cross from East Germany into West Germany. Okay. It was the Fulda Gap. It was just a big, wide river valley. And we watched 
mock dog fights with uh, jet aircraft over over that really valley and we could stand there in the antenna field and, and watch the MIGs and the, the jets from Frankfurt Air Force Base buzz each other. So they just they just were kind of they, uh, they shot, tried just they, to see who could fly the best. Who could I fly guess the best, but no no missiles or <coughs> no like, ammunition they didn't, fired. Just uh, and I was stationed four different places up on the east west German border with uh, agency personnel. And the one thing that, that really stuck in my mind about the Cold War was there was a, uh, I'm assuming it was a German family because it was East Germany they were coming out of. And they tried to swim the folded river and the Russian guards turned a machine gun on them and, and shot and killed the mother and the little boy drowned. And, we they found his body the next day. The little girl made it across. And we there was two of us swam out and got her. There was a steel cable ran down the center of the river. Half of it was West Germany, half of it was East Germany. So they were willing to risk their lives to get out of the, the communist or the right. East Germany. And that 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 always stuck in my mind about the Cold War wasn't always so cold. It was terrible. Eddie, how about you? You know, uh, I didn't know how I was going to explain it when I got up here, but uh, I didn't see any action like John did. But we, uh, to me, the Cold War was just was was a lot of training and a lot of preparing. You had to stay prepared, and. Uh, he was always either doing some type of training, and some of the more serious things we done was, we used to uh, supply medical support and uh, ambulance support to uh, the armored outfits and stuff up on the Czech border. But we'd go up there and sit up there and uh, with them, and uh, they're you know you're sitting there on a the line and you got your red Czech guards over here and walking the fence, and uh, our guards are over here walking the fence, and and you know you'd stop and think sometimes. Uh, Wonder what would happen if, if 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 it did start up right now, you know. I mean, but uh, we that was one of the things we did. But it, it was just mostly uh, preparing and and staying alert and uh, uh, a lot of maneuvers, a lot of field maneuvers. Uh, I've got a thing about cold weather. I guess every place I go, I, I run into the coldest weather they've ever had, and in <laughs> in '74. I mean, in 64, we was over in Germany, and uh, uh, it was one of the coldest winters they'd had in 30 years, and we was out on a 15-day uh, maneuver, and after about six days, they called it off because there were so many cases of frostbite and stuff like that, you know, and so they called it off. But uh, it was uh, just more or less being prepared and being and, and ready in case uh, uh, anything did happen. We uh, another another thing that we done it I actually felt like was in, real important was uh, we had missile silos over there, and uh, we'd uh, every weekend you catch I mean uh, somebody would catch uh, a duty driving an ambulance or a naveman or something, and any time they would move these missiles, these warheads, then you had to go with them and move with them and and everything until they got it set back up and all that stuff. That was kind of important, I thought, you know, uh, one of the important things we could done. But basically, I would say the Cold War was just uh, being prepared and, and, and... Like you said, constantly yeah, training. Training and training. And hoping and praying that nothing goes wrong. Yeah. Now, what kind of, what kind of casualties did, did you deal with as being you were a medic? Was it, was it mainly just uh, everyday kind of things, cuts, bruises, stuff like that? Or? Yeah, we... Uh, uh, Frostbite, when, obviously. When when I was in uh, uh, Fort Carson, uh, I was in a field outfit, a field hospital, uh, assigned to a field hospital. But we were uh, TDY to the to the general hospital there, so we worked in the hospital just uh, just like Western Baptist here, you know. Or so, and we we were corpsmen. Uh, we took the vital signs and uh, emptied the bedpans, you know, and all the good stuff. You all know, the fun that, stuff. Yeah, huh? the fun stuff. Another thing that we did uh, out there that I was kind of proud of uh, when I was at Fort Carson, uh, 
they had the fifth division out there was at that time was one of the if not the only one uh, combat ready units that there was and in 63 i think it was like they had a major war games uh up in the carolinas an 82nd airborne 101st airborne a couple of infantry you know uh, division and stuff, and uh, they airlifted that whole 5th Division out of Fort Carson and to go up there like it was a real thing, and they took everybody. And uh, we had, uh, I, that was real interesting, I mean, it was... That was a massive uh, undertaking. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was real. Uh, I could, we had aid stations set up at uh, Denver Airport and the Pueblo, uh, Colorado Airport, and uh, Colorado Springs Airport. and. Uh, to watch those big uh, planes come in there, those cargo planes, and drop that tailgate down on them and run tanks up in there and do some and halves and everything. It, it was, uh, you know, it was something to see. Again, being prepared. Yeah. Being just, just in case. Them games, I think, went on a couple of weeks and then they brought everybody back, you know, but it was. Uh, so you were like what we like what we used to call an ATT Army Training Test. That's you know done them, and that's how you got your ratings and uh, whether you was combat ready or not. Well, now John, uh, being an MP, you know, like I say, your major it sounds like you primarily were protecting top secret uh, stuff that they didn't uh, had to be very careful to keep keep safely guarded. Uh, how were your hours? Did you was it like you worked every we five worked. days a week or all? all we worked. 24 7. 24 7. Uh, eight, 8 to 4, 4 to midnight, midnight to 8. Did you, ever, did you ever get leave to get off the base or anything? Theoretically, we got, we worked three days, three midnights, three evenings, three midnights, and then we got three days off. And okay. we were short when they were building up for Vietnam, and we went 19. 19 months over there that we didn't get any days off. We just went three days, three seconds, three midnights, and then we had, actually it was two days off. You, you got to sleep one day and then you got up one day and then the, the, the third day you were back working again. So and a lot, of the, a lot of it was spent that way. Did you ever get any uh was there a town or anything nearby where you could go and, and oh, get was, away from the base for a while? Or? Oh, yeah, there was a town of 150,000. Castle, Germany was 12 clicks away from us. So, uh, and they had buses that ran from post into town. Of course, when you got over there, you, you always had about 10 or 12 people that go together and buy an old Volkswagen. Really? Yeah, yeah you didn't need bus. You could. How, how many, they ran off of mo gas. How, how many cops could you cram in a Volkswagen? I'm about seven or eight. <laughs> <laughs> speaking, <laughs> spe, <laughs> speaking of them Volkswagens, I had one uh, over there. It was a, a '52 model, and I don't know how far down the line I was, uh, you know, of owning it. But it, every time somebody rotates, they just sell it to somebody else. And I thought it was kind of funny. It, it had the turn signals at the little arms come out on the door posts and blinked, you know. And, really? Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. that's the first time I've ever seen one. <laughs> in Volkswagens, I tell you, they get, uh, they're like the little Energizer bunny. Those things that just go and go and go and go. We had a, a bus over there that uh, the kennel master, we had dogs as, uh, there on that security base. And he had a, a Volkswagen bus that he had bought off of a medic that was stationed there at, at Roth Western. And that was the like seventh or eighth owner. And they just, it just got where they just marked the name out and printed the new name. They didn't even send the paperwork anymore. You know, they just, <laughs> they just had to, they handed it to you. <coughs> he was the, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Halota was the the seventh owner of that of that bus, and when he went to Nam, he sold it to uh, a guy in headquarters headquarters company, and, and it traveled on. It was a I don't think it was old as yours. I think it was it was probably a newer model, about a '55, 
something like that. This was most in 66. Watch, most of the people watching this show were even <laughs> bored yet yeah, for crying out loud. Well, when you went into town, I'm sure you had uh, I had your share of fun and uh, oh, absolutely, know, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Did it help you? You think being an MP, having the MP? Uh, oh yeah, we we had a place called the uh, Deuce, the Four Deuces. That was where we went. We had a big oak table about ten feet across, and and that's where all of us went and drank and and had our fun, and occasionally we'd stray into other people's bars and. They'd run us out, and then we'd go wait for them at the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good they idea. won't play silly games in town. We play at home. Okay, guys. All right. we'll see all <laughs> it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. We had a, we had a uh, deal over there where the new guy in, we, of course, we'd take him to town and get him drunk that first you're really night. You're going to tell us, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> this, is, this is too good to be true. <laughs> they had a, a shot of real clear liquid, and when you lit it, it just kind of had a, a, a little blue color came off of oh, it. Oh, Lord. And the secret was you threw the shot down and drank it all at once. If you put it to your mouth and tried to sip it, that was on fire, and it would literally come down the corners of your mouth and burn. You know, you could tell a new guy at the base for about a week because he had all these scabs on his <laughs> face where that stuff had burned him. <laughs> And now, when you did it, did you do it right or did you get burned? Oh, yeah, nobody does it right. Nobody <laughs> believes that you're going to be able to drink that and that fire go out, you I'll know. I'll tell you. I'll tell you uh, I burned my nose. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you another one that, that goes along the same lines like that. It, it, this is something, I mean, it didn't hurt nobody, but it, it, some, sometimes it makes some of them mad. Uh, you have a lot of places over there it's got boots and they serve the beer and in mm. the boot well there's a secret it's a to glass boot a glass oh, boot I was say, I was, <laughs> and my uh, reflex was about to go there but there's a but there's a secret to drinking out of it uh, you start uh, with the toe of the boot down and as you drink it down and and the volume uh, uh, goes away then you can turn the toe up toward the uh, top but if you start <laughs> if if you start out with the full boot and your toes up the top, then it all comes out at one time. And uh, a lot of guys used to uh, any green. That, that was one of the things they used to get them on. So you just you always told them this is the way you drink this. Yeah, then, yeah. Just hand no, it. No, you just hand, just hand it to them. You didn't the, tell them. Oh, you just uh, didn't no, say no, anything. No. You just not until after they done. Well, they learned after they drowned it or so. <laughs> we used to play liar's dice with the boot. Liar's dice. Or liars poker. Oh yeah. With dollar bills and and instead of paying money, you had to. If you got caught lying, you had to chug the boot. And as you you gave a number, of course the boot got passed around. Everybody took a drink out of it. So hopefully, when you got caught, you were down in the bottom of the boot when you got caught. <laughs> Otherwise. Hey, you probably didn't play over two or three hands. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, you, <laughs> you, you we would pass out in the corner. We got to get back to the base and wait on those guys that threw us out of the other bar over there. You <laughs> no, right? no, we just prop them up over in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> prop me up against the jukebox. Yeah. Right. Okay. You know, Larry, the uh, the one thing that uh, a lot of younger people might not realize about the Cold War was uh, even though there wasn't any uh, battles per se taking place, it was a very serious time and a very serious situation to be in, regardless of where you were stationed at, because uh, you didn't know you was going to stay there. And as Vietnam heated up, uh, a lot of units from Germany ended up going to Vietnam. And uh, so you, you, you didn't know, but it, the whole deal was taken fairly seriously. I mean, it, uh, it wasn't really... Uh, I'm sure a lot of people think, well, they didn't see no combat. They wouldn't, you know, uh, they had it made. Well, that not necessarily true. You're still in a situation that from day to day you don't know what's yeah, going to happen. Right. And, and all it takes is one person pushing that first button and, and, and it ain't, ain't, ain't no pulling them back. Mm -hmm. Well, if they'd come across the Folder Gap, our life expectancy at uh, 319th SA Battalion was 30 seconds. Ooh. Because the when they, they came through, you could stand on top of the hill 
and looked, and you could see like 10 miles down that wow, thing. Okay. And they supposedly had about 60 uh, mechanized units that they were going to throw at us, you know, when they started rolling it, in. It was going to get real ugly. Yeah. Well, guys, we're down about the, just the last three or four minutes here. And somebody, I always get done, and somebody says, man, I wish I'd have said this. Is there, uh, is there any one story or something that, that, that you want to share before we run out of time here? I mean, that's something that really stands out, either a really good time or a really bad time that, that you'd like to, to share with the audience that you can tell on TV. I mean, I've heard some of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some of them at the Post, and I, 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 we talked about that. There's it's just, uh, I remember, I guess the one thing, because I was young, I was 17 years old, and uh, I spent three Christmases, I was in the service less than three years, about 18 days, and I spent three Christmases overseas. Uh, I left Germany on New Year's Day, January 1965, not in the best shape because uh, New Year's Eve was pretty wild, me knowing I was going home too. Uh, but, uh, and like I said before, uh, we, we took it pretty seriously. You know. Well, I certainly commend both of you, you know, for the time you, you, you spent over there. And because I know they're going to keep you busy. They're going to keep you hopping. You're going to be doing maneuvers and, and running here and there. And you're always in the back of your mind, you're wondering, am I going to end up in Vietnam? And in your case, you actually did. So, which I imagine was quite a transition to go from, from what you were to what you went into at Vietnam. I, I, oh yeah, there, there there was no pretty green uniforms in Vietnam and no squad cars and it, it was a, it was a whole different was, world. Uh, the jeep became a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> things changed, but they always had something for you to do. You know, they, one of the things, that, real quick, uh, one of their uh, tools for reenlistment. Was they would give you a, a, an off, uh, they would give you a warn commission and send you to helicopter pilot school. Well, that, you know, it didn't take no Einstein to figure it out. You was going to Nam if you if you done that. That's oh. that's what they needed for. Yeah. Guys, I, I told you this half hour fly and it did. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you guys coming out today and and sharing. And maybe we'll come on another time and get you guys back up here again and talk about it a little bit more, or we can think up another subject. But. We can uh, we can go ahead and retire to our little old orderly room right now and maybe talk about a few uh, stories you'd like to have told. So I want to thank you all for tuning in for Veteran Voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this program, and we'll see you next time.